Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, we continue our discussions, and uh, the next presentation will be done by Uli Brandt and Markus Wissen. They will speak for half an hour. And then we will have uh, comments by Christa Wisterich, Wichterich, uh, sorry, and uh, Torkil Lausen. Uh, they will speak each for 15 minutes, and then we have discussion. So Uli and Markus, please go ahead. Yeah, many thanks. And um, yeah, before we start, again, thank you from my side to all of you. To you in Amsterdam as the organizers, Marcel, Hermann, and Joost, and to all the speakers and commentators for um, yeah, engaging so with our concept, imperial mode of living, and commenting. So I have benefited a lot from these presentations and comments up to this point in time. And indeed, uh, we feel very honored for this very deep engagement uh, with the concept. Thanks again for this. Yeah, um, the imperial mode of living and the present global situation is the title of this and my presentation. And we uh, would like to talk about five points. First, um, we start with a basic assumption. How can we understand the current situation? There's a great crisis, an interregnum. Michael has already used this term in the morning. We would like to present three scenarios on how future developments could go on. Third, we would sketch some elements of a solidary mode of living. Fourth, discuss some learning processes that we have observed, that one can observe in the corona crisis. And fifth, um, ask some or raise some open questions with reference to the presenta presentations and comments and the discussions that we had so far. So first of all, the basic assumption from which we start. So this assumption is largely based in the regulation theoretical context. So in a context out of which, um, in which Bob also has um, situated his analysis in the morning. And indeed we are deeply indebted to the work of Bob as an uh, important representative of the, let's say, state theoretical branch of the regulation theory. He and Joachim Hirsch um, have founded the regulation theoretical tradition um, uh, from which um, Uli and I have benefited very much and in which we also see ourselves. Yeah. So our assumption would be that we are in a great crisis, so not in a minor crisis, in a great crisis, a minor crisis that can be um, solved, overcome through adaptations, through institutional adaptations, we have a great crisis requires much more deeper going process of transformation. We can also use the Gramscian term of an interregnum, an interregnum between two modes of capitalist development, or maybe also between capitalism and another form of societalization. We think that the crisis at the moment is so deep that we should also discuss how we can transcend capitalism. That means if there are significant forces in the direction of a transcendence of capitalism. We would say that neoliberal forces still dominate. They dominate institutions, economy, the academia. Look at the economic sciences, economics that are nearly completely dominated by neoclassical economics. So they are forces of inertia of this neoliberal post for this phase of capitalism that we have to take into account and that cannot simply be overcome. But, and I think this is very important, these forces of neoliberal post fordist capitalism are not able to organize stable compromises again uh, any longer. They are not able to organize hegemony any longer. Neoliberal policies originally began to confront the contradictions of the Fordist mode of capitalist development. They politicized these contradictions and proposed an alternative, an alternative that has shaped the last decades, the last four decades, at least in the countries of the global north, but also with significant effects on the countries of the global south. 
Today, neoliberal policies do not confront the contradictions of Fordism anymore. They confront the contradictions that they themselves have produced. And they're not able to contain these contradictions, but the elements, the instruments that they have developed so far in the last decades sharpen economic, social, and ecological contradictions. Commodifying ever more spheres of society and nature used to serve the accumulation strategies of very diverse fractions of capital in the last decades. Bob talked about the knowledge-based economy in the morning. Indeed, information technology in various areas of the economy, in agriculture and industrial production, in mobility and so on, was very important. Today, this commodification of ever more social spheres that has been initiated in neoliberal capitalism turns out as a major driver of the exhaustion of labor power, the demolition of essential infrastructures, and the destruction of natural habitats, which then strikes back in the forms of diseases. We consider the corona crisis that we have been facing for um, nearly two years now as a major um, example for this disability of, cap of neoliberalism to cope with the self-produced contradictions any longer. So one could indeed, with Rob Wallace and others, consider the pandemic as a neoliberal disease because it has to do with the fact that capitalism evades or in, yeah, grabs land and introduces certain forms of commodification in ever more social and natural spheres and thereby produces diseases, produces effects that strike back to capitalism and cannot be controlled by neoliberal forces anymore. The corona crisis, the corona pandemic is one outstanding example for this. So one could possibly speak about the exhaustion of the possibility of containing, of processing social contradictions under neoliberal conditions. The Spatial temporal fix, to use this concept that Bob has introduced in the morning, the spatial temporal fix of neoliberalism is exhausted, is in a deep crisis. The imperial mode of living as a spatial temporal fix of neoliberalism has got into a crisis. However, its attractiveness is still quite strong. We experience counter movements by the extreme right and weaker counter movements from the progressive left, we see that there is an unsettledness in search processes on the side of the neoliberal elites that are uh, yeah, in a situation where they really recognize their inability to cope with the problems that are aggravating, be it ecological, economic, social. They do not have convincing answers. They are not able to organize society any longer in a way that stable social compromise or even certain forms of hegemony evolve in order to contain the capitalist contradictions. In this situation, we can observe three scenarios. This one, we already talked about this yesterday, is an authoritarian stabilization of the imperial mode of living. That is what um, we have experienced in the United States, but also in many other countries where right um, political leaders, right political for forces um, enter highest government um, positions and um, try to exclusively stabilize the imperial mode of living in with respect to a certain territorial. Second strategy is ecological modernization. Ecological modernization in the direction of a green capitalism. We would consider this as a passive revolution, to use this Gramscian term. So as a revolution that leaves the basic mechanisms of society intact, but it does so via transforming the way of operating of capitalism. This is what we can observe in the diverse green economy strategies. We do not speak about the green, about the green New Deal strategies, here we already uh, mentioned the um, strategies by Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez in the United States, but also 
partially of the British Labour Party, there are other programs, other approaches to a Green New Deal. This has to be distinguished from the green economy because these Green New Deal strategies are much more progressive than the dominant green economy strategies. We consider them as a kind of neoliberal attempt to save capitalism, to save even certain elements of neoliberalism in the new capitalist mode of development. This is driven by scientific findings, findings of climate science. This is driven by the recent politicization of the climate crisis through particularly Fridays for Future. It is driven by new and new technological possibilities that have been developed more recently, like, for example, in areas as mobility, energy provision, housing, industrial production. And there are many economic interests backing these green strategies because they depend on the distribution, the diffusion, the strengthening of the new technological possibilities that have been developed in recent years. So um, in his presentation in the morning, in the morning Bob um, talked about an ecologically friendly no growth regime. We would also see the possibility of not so ecologically friendly, nevertheless green capitalism as a new phase of capitalist development following post for this neoliberalism. We see some certain hegemonic potentials for this, although of course it will be in time and space very restricted. So we also differ a little bit from um, Torkel, Torkel Lausen, who in his book on writing the wave distinguishes between two major forces in current times, nationalism and neoliberalism, we would say First, there is a third force, more progressive force. I will come to that later on. And we would say that neoliberalism isn't the same as it used to be in the last decades because neoliberalism is graining. And perhaps it can also draw on financial capital. Financial capital is also yeah, um, interested in yeah, investing into new green accumulation strategies. So it could be that the financial capital that was a dominant force, a dominant capitalist force in the period of post fordist neoliberalism, assumes a position also in a green capitalism, a position that does not longer yeah, restrict real accumulation, but foster real accumulation. It could be again in the service of real accumulation. We do not know, it's just a bit speculative here. But um, there are some incident, there is some evidence on this, for example, movements of divestment and out of fossil fuels into new technologies or the big insurance companies who simply cannot afford to invest in fossil energy because going on with fossil energy will pose a major risk for them and will possibly mean an economic disaster. So they are interested in strengthening green capital fractions, not only for making profits, but also for protecting themselves against certain risks of fossil capitalism and the aggravating climate crisis. As already said, we consider this um, green capitalism, this ecological modernization strategy quite exclusive. It may be that the, that, that the dependence on raw materials shifts from fossil fuels to metals to biomass, but there will still be a dependence. There will be still be the need for spatial temporal fix for an externalization of social ecological costs in space and time. And the imperatives of competition and growth threaten to overcompensate the environmental benefits these green ecological modernization strategies have. Sabrina yesterday talked about the effects of green strategies, the impact of green strategies in the global north on the countries of the global south. I think this is an outstanding um, yeah, example for the spatial exclusiveness and for the very um, restrictive applicability or viability of ecological modernization strategies in space and time. So the question is, is there a third 
alternative. And we would say there's a third scenario, which we call the solidary mode of living, feminist democratic eco-socialism, that would strengthen and equally distribute care, uh, care work, decommodify and enhance social and physical infrastructures and put them under democratic control. Just to um, sketch some elements of this, the elements of a solidary mode of living in this way would be, first of all, the idea of rethinking the economy from the logic of care and infrastructure provision for basic human needs and rights. This is largely um, something that has a long history, a long discussion in the feminist debate, and Christa will certainly touch that point later on in her comment. It has discussed in other contexts in Germany. Linksnetz um, has suggested the public provision of infrastructure as and the, the free access to basic infrastructural services as the most important form of social polities years ago. And more recently, the Foundation Economy Collective has proposed a new economy of everyday life that strengthens social and physical infrastructures and the access of people to these infrastructures. There are entry points for such a strategy, and therefore it's not just a, something that we um, that, that is uh, that only exists in theoretical terms. It is something or in, in hypothetical terms. It is something that really has certain um, roots in everyday experiences, particularly in the crisis experience of the corona pandemic, where we saw that there was a completely new definition of systemic relevance. In the crisis of 2008, 2009, banks were considered systemically relevant. They were too big to fail. But in the corona crisis, no one talked about banks as systemically relevant anymore. The systemically relevant forces are workers in hospitals, in supermarkets, in agriculture, in food production, in industries, producing for the health sector. This was a redefinition of systemic relevance that unfortunately was not followed by an improvement of the very often very precarious working conditions of people in these areas. But nevertheless, I think it was an experience that will overlast the corona crisis and an experience from which left progressive strategies in favor of a solidary mode of living can really start. The everyday solidarity also is quite important, yeah? that people helped each other, you know, that they saw that they were embedded in social networks and that it is important for a good life to be embedded in social networks on which one can draw in cases of emergency. With that, I hand over to Uli, who is going to proceed with learning processes in the corona crisis and the insight I have mentioned at the end. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Markus. Um, yeah, and thank you for, for the um, technical support. And um, yeah, we were asked or we, we agreed upon to talk a bit more about the current constellation and uh, Markus um, ended also with the crisis experiences. We refer a bit to our work and as we also uh, wrote in the paper, it's the closing um, a chapter of the English version of the book, Improvement of Living, but also we refer to the work of the Institute of um, Social Analysis at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. They published already, I think, in May 2020, a very interesting and large and well thought paper on these possible potential learning processes. And we have so much other work which is uh, done. And after this, it will be very brief. Um, I will also go back to the um, discussion of yesterday and to the reading of the papers um, for this conference and, and um, formulate some open questions. Um, maybe in a sense that um, at the end, we have also Nora's input, what could be further questions for a research agenda. Uh, I didn't consider the discussion in this morning because I um, finished the presentation before the morning session. But of course, um, after the um, session with Bob and Micha, um, there we have even more um, uh, interesting points. So our point with the learning, pro the potential, I have to underline, we have to underline the potential learning processes. And um, 
And just to give you an example, we are a year later. It is, we wrote this mid of 2020, and, and we can also think a bit uh, um, together um, how where where is really an opening and how certain aspects were and now diffused or overruled. So the major point or one major point is that that there are political logics. Um, that were changing and the reappreciation of the state of the interventionist state, we already discussed this, that mobilizes regulatory and financial re um, resources. Um, sorry for the, no, it's fine. Um, Torquil Olier um, already mentioned this in the morning. And this is not just as Maris de las Pampa from Argentina called it the Hals Leviathan, but we also have this experience. Um, and this was taken up in from the climate justice movement and others to say, okay, now the state shows that intervention is a possible, and this is close to the third scenario uh, Marcus was mentioning. We also um, experienced at the beginning of the corona uh, pandemic uh, um, a very partial, but not, uh, uh, not unimportant uh, experience of the conversion, of a partial conversion, uh, for example, in the automotive sector, when Trump was forcing um, um, general uh, motors to produce uh, medical um, apparatuses. And we have this also um, discussion about a necessary regionalization of production because the global uh, production chains are weak, are vulnerable. We discussed this already. And also this could be a learning process for a solidary mode of living um, a social ecological transformation. Um, the strengthen of reproduction, which was already discussed, and um, also, also Marcus referred to it, the social infrastructure, the question of reproduction, and also what uh, we consider important, knowing that there are huge splits uh, within the um, population um, among the workers or the wage earners who could afford uh, to, to work um, in home office, who had to go to the factories, to the offices, uh, to the uh, to the selling points, but um, the corona uh, crisis showed the potential to really rethink everyday lives. Yeah? I remember last year in June, May, June 2020 in Austria, where um, the Austrian uh, government and the Austrian tourist agency started huge campaigns. Now we need to um, stay within Austria for for the summer holidays, but this is not so bad. Maybe we can also rethink not to fly uh, to the Mediterranean um, with all the ambiguities for the tourism industry there, but um, maybe to, to have something attractive in, in this case, um, when, when we travel, when we go for holidays, but something attractive, which is, which is closer, which is not only the the larger trips. And then Nailing touched upon this um, yesterday, um, and I find this, found this very, very interesting when she talked about China, this interesting dialectics between renationalization, international cooperation, um, but also international competition, and how to understand this, and where are here the emancipatory um, aspects. Next slide, Marcus, please. So this, this is what we um, also um, outlined a bit in our, in our paper, and this is from the final section of the book. And now I want to um, conclude this um, intervention for the, for the um, afternoon session with some open questions. The question which arose prior to the conference, but now also during the conference. Bob um, and Bob and, and, and Nailing also worked on this um, and um, referred in his presentation to uh, again to the imaginary of a knowledge economy. We discussed this briefly. And uh, to us, it would be interesting to get um, some thoughts and to discuss some thoughts, because I think we underestimated the role of the knowledge economy in our, uh, in our book, in our further work. And um, what, how can we understand, how can we conceptualize and make sense of the imperial character of the knowledge economy, of the imperial mode of production and living? Um, where are crucial elements? Of course, we think about uh, an IPR, but maybe it's further. A second aspect, which also we discussed this um, um, at other occasions, M Marcus now presented scenarios. We could also say it's projects in the Gramscian sense, in a neo Gramscian sense, that forces um, gather, organize around uh, different projects. Um, Markus outlined uh, our proposal to think three projects. Uh, Dieter Klein um, from Rosa Luxor Foundation always also outlines projects, the EFG, the Institute of Social Analysis, and others. And how to link this would be interesting to um, these 
potential projects, scenarios, organizing, they try to organize certain forms of hegemony with the idea of um, imaginaries uh, outlined in, in CPE, in cultural uh, political economy. Are the imaginaries um, something, um, um, let's say, um, before? Are the imaginaries um, um, a precondition to form, a, let's say, the knowledge economy to formulate projects or uh, are they an effect of the projects or are they part of the project? Would be interesting to get the answer. A third open question we have, and Nora posted yesterday, and it was a bit uh, it left and um, unanswered um, in Marcel's paper, and I like it very much because he gives so he of course Marcel you know quite well the literature and you show um, quite very convincingly the negative consequences of uh, the imperial mode of production and living and the, the imperial mode of working if you like the uh, labor relations, um, but if we understand and you open up the Paper, you open your paper also with, um, with um, Alf Hornburg, with society or societal nature relations, which is not, which is more than beyond, uh, which is beyond the negative consequences. How can we understand these relational perspectives? I think we, coming from political ecology, we do it, but um, maybe there is a um, misunderstanding or further work needed to go beyond this. Uh, okay, there is the capitalist, imperial, um, mode of production and living, and there are these negative consequences, but how can we think this relation? A fourth, maybe not an open question, but already a question because Torkel will talk in a moment, and thank you very much, Torkel, for this very well thought paper and also for your comment, uh, a very large and interesting comment uh, on the book, uh, and also congratulations to you, your new book. You argue at the end of your paper for the conference that the um, Imperial Mode of Living gets into a crisis, and this is mainly due to the struggles for higher wages in countries such as China, because this means less profits for the North, less value transfer. We would argue, and I think Stefan argued a bit into the same direction uh, um, yesterday, that um, it's not the crisis of the IMOL, it's a transformation of the IMOL, and it would be interesting to, to, um, to uh, get your point and maybe uh, also thoughts from others in what sense the IMOL is in crisis. We argue that it's a structural category. We don't talk about the imperial modes of living as an, a kind of an empirical fact. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theoretical category. It's a structural feature um, of capitalism, um, of, the, of, um, of the history of capitalism. So, and we would argue it's, um, it, it, there, there is a kind of um, yeah, a transformation. The last point, the next slide, Markus. Um, the last point refers also to, um, I think, the, the debate on internationalism, the debate on international solidarity. Um, Nora is um, 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 insisting on um, with with all the rights, and I find this very interesting, um, important, of course. And um, Torquil, um, I quote you from your paper, and um, you argue that it's not wrong to defend the welfare state, but struggles. Uh, struggle has to be fought um, in a global context and not isolated in a, um, as isolated national defense. Of course, we agree. And in fact, and we, we outlined this in the foreword to the English edition, not on purpose, but in, as an effect, we intervened into an um, important debate uh, within the German left around the position of Sarah Wagenknecht, Oskar Lafontaine, uh, Martin Höbner and others who argued uh, after the, um, uh, the, the refugee um, uh, movement or the so-called refugee crisis, that um, we cannot um, accept too many refugees because then the competition among the lower strata of society will increase and this will um, push um, the workers and their votes uh, into the arms of the far right, of the AfD. In the case of Germany, we can also uh, see this in, um, uh, listen to this argument in Austria with the, with the FPÖ. And we argue, yeah, okay, this would be an, 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 an extra debate, but um, we intervened into this with an international internationalist perspective. And we would uh, argue that, of course, we need a democratic and ecologically transformed welfare state as a crucial element. And the welfare state up to date is organized at the national and now a bit at the European level. However, and this is um, Torkil's, um, um, if you like, 
provocation, the global must be part of it. Yeah, and um, Nora also insisted uh, that um, the communication among workers, the relationship among the workers is so key um, uh, um, among them um, when they live in different countries and different regions. So how can we rethink international solidarity? And for us, one element, beside all the other elements of, it, of the also historical experience of international solidarity is um, that international solidarity, in fact, as a practice, would crucially consist if we think in terms of imperial mode of production living, would crucially consist of the radical transformation of, of the own living conditions and of the own production conditions in Europe, in Germany, UK, wherever uh, we are now. Um, because um, this emancipatory radical social ecological transformation would lower the pressure on uh, countries of the global south, would lower the pressure on this competition, which of course is competition mainly in favor of capital accumulation. So one element of this rethinking of international solidarity would be, let's say, not the ex we need the explicit solidarity, the explicit um, uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, if you like, with other struggles and to understand our own struggles in light of them, but also to change our living conditions. If, let's say, the... Um, the stay grounded initiative or um, um, in Europe to, to cut it back, to, um, uh, to reduce uh, drastically um, air transport. Um, this um, has to do with the global south. Yeah, I referred yesterday briefly to this conflict. What is the global horizon of the conflicts? I hope that, uh, that you get my point. And um, to, to um, integrate, uh, to, um, to promote, I don't want to be paternalistic, talking about uh, conflicts and movements. This is why I'm a bit careful. But to promote or to look at this as a self-understanding of the concrete emancipatory conflicts as part of global struggles, that, that they put them uh, um, in a global horizon. Yeah? That even now the struggles in Berlin, as I said yesterday, for the socialization of um, major real estate uh, companies, this, uh, this could be seen in a, in a, in a broader context. And, this, and, and then we might think uh, in, in, about modes in the plural of emancipation, as Stefan all, um, yesterday told us. And my last uh, point, or our last point is, um, and Markus also mentioned it already, um, that I think the work of Markus and me is very much motivated exactly by this second uh, scenario, second project, also, if you like, second imaginary, that um, even within the left, and Sabrina showed this when she talked yesterday about the left in Brazil, um, but we, we live in Europe and we work and struggle in Europe, um, the main danger, and we see this now in the German election campaign, is um, that as a, the most progressive imaginary is seen a selective green modernization of the imperial model of living yeah? in parts of the global north, Maybe even not in whole Europe, yeah, but only in parts in some countries where you have industry, where you have the compromises, where you have the relevant forces, where you have the yeah a, a certain constellation, but with negative implications uh, in the global south, but also within within Europe. So I think this is um, why it seems to us so important to push off, maybe also with other concepts, not necessarily with improvement mode of living, but to push this debate, to bring this debate into, um, uh, into, um, our, um, uh, into our societies. And I give you an example, and not in a pejorative way, but just to, because it struck me, and um, um, it, um, because it's, 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 a, it's um, such an emblematic example. Bernd Rixinger, uh, um, the former um, head of the, the left, he published this book. Um, I already said this yesterday, and I want to conclude with this uh, again. And in his book on the Green New Deal, he um, ju just has uh, um, almost has no mention to the global south, to the to the sites where the resources come from, to the experiences, to the living uh, context and conditions uh, elsewhere beyond Europe. And I think this is an um, imperative for a leftist project um, here and today, which needs to be further formulated to consider this and to avoid this trap of a selective green. Um, modernization of capitalism. And thank you for the attention. 
thank you, uh, Uri. Thank you, Marcus. Um, we immediately continue with Krista, who will give us give us her thoughts on these issues. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to the conference uh, so that I can benefit as well from these very inspiring papers and debates. Since years, I'm involved in conversation with Uli and Markus about the inclusion of social reproduction and care into the imperial mode of living, acknowledging the indivisibility of production, social reproduction, and mode of living. I propose to integrate the gender hierarchical relations of caring and reproduction as a form of internal patriarchal imperialism, what Maria Mills called internal colonization. To facilitate this integration, I propose the concept of care extractivism, analog to resource extractivism, which can be used at the national and at the transnational level across class and caste divisions and divisions between the global north and the global south. The paradigm of care extractivism could bring in a stronger intersectional perspective, which was missing in the beginning, I found, and could sharpen the look at racialized and ethnicized labor and resource relations. It could deepen not only the necessary analysis of labor and class relations in a historical perspective, but also the analysis of changing power, access, and political agency from colonial times to Fordism and post Fordist society. Now the pandemic has illustrated the central and the essential role of social reproduction for the mode of production and living. And I'm very happy that the papers of Uli and Marcus take up care work in the health sector in a prominent way, moving between Naomi Klein's Corona capitalism, which assumes that the crisis is used to establish new modes of accumulation, and Mike Davis' optimistic focus on the restructuring of the health sector as permanent fishing form. However, I still need to do more profound research on the structures and the labor relations in the past economy. In my reading, the paper of the two is an exploration of the question whether and to which extent the corona crisis, like other crises, is a chance for social ecological transformation. Let me disclose that in my personal political biography, the corona crisis is the fourth crisis after the oil crisis in the 70s, the Asian crisis in the 90s, the financial crisis in 2008, which is discussed as a window of opportunity for a shift of time. The paper of Amatis and Uli is pronouncing very much this optimism regarding transformation. I shared this optimism once again at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, when the essentiality of care became visible and perceptible in a broad sense. The overworked and underpaid nurse of an intensive unit who didn't get enough protective gear became the icon of the crisis of social reproduction during the pandemic. She, and not the worker in the automobile industry, like in earlier crisis situations. By the way, feminists prefer to call care work essential to life instead of calling it essential to the system, which is a more functionalistic reference to the capitalist efficiency of However, in earlier crisis situations, we learned that there is not at all an automatism about the crisis turning the tide towards an alternative paradigm. It all depends from critical agency and changing power relations. I was asking myself by reading R. Marcus and Uli over optimistic, meaning a bit unknown. Their optimistic optimism is grounded well in five aspects. However, cross cutting in this crisis, much more than in earlier crises, are also Italianism and nationalism in governance fostered by civil society organizations and social movements. They are on the rise and result in many countries in shaping democratic states. I would like to take the health sector 
as an essential area in everyday life and uh, of the imperial mode of living and check the arguments of Martin and Lily and at the same time sharpen them while asking if we talk about corona capitalism, what does it mean in the health sector? Additional to Naomi Klein, I refer to Siti Bhattacharya, who has written a theory of social reproduction. She sharpened Klein's point by calling the COVID capitalism an economy of destruction, which gives preference to death making over life making in nature and society. The COVID-19 crisis aggravated an already prevailing crisis of social reproduction, primarily a shortage of care workers in the precarious working conditions. Since years, nearly the own health systems, with big health and clinic populations are marked by a profound crisis caused by an institutional drive to grow in terms of technology and profit on the one hand, and on the other hand, Austerity regarding healthcare labor. Healthcare institutions are understaffed, the staff is overworked, their work is undervalued and underpaid, burnout is considered a normal occupational disease. This indicates that the rational of care and the capitalist rational of the labor market clash due to neoliberal policies and population. At the end of the day, the system is unfit to provide good and to deal with the emergency situation. This village is not the neoliberal sector. In Germany, the attention to the health cover has the effect that the government now promotes slightly better wages for health cover, however, without touching the neoliberal structures. The health minister insists on sustaining the accounting system in hospitals according to diagnosis-related groups, which create a financial squeeze in health institutions and historical methods. At the, end, at the same time, he, the minister, promises tirelessly to recruit the much-needed health personnel from abroad, from Bosnia to Mexico, to government countries, thus normalizing transnational care activity in order to guarantee the employment mode of living in social reproduction. COVID-19 has fueled the commodification of care with dramatic effects. Presently, the Philippines, for example, are suffering from a life-threatening shortage of nurses in their hospitals. Last year, President Duterte even imposed a ban on the outmigration of nurses for some months, but he offered to Britain and Germany a deal to exchange nurses against vaccines. Obviously, the German government agreed in order to combat the shortage of nurses in Germany at the cost of health provision for the Filipino population. There are no signs that the managing of the post pandemic crisis is done um, by a change of the overall neoliberal cost but it is done by new spatial and technical fixes in the health. New austerity measures and new forms of care expectability will accelerate the spiral of crisis situations in the health sector. The care spiral means to me that the crisis is managed with a care expectability strategy, for example, more transnationalization, more valorization, more digitalization of travel. But this creates a new depletion and burnout of the workforce and the structures. And thus a new crisis, which provokes a new form of care acceptability and so on. The system is moving towards a tipping point where the entire health system could fall. The same holds true for the existing nuclear family system due to homeschooling, home office, refamilization of care work, and traditionalization of gender. Another structural feature of the embeddedness of care activism in the capitalist economy is the financialization of transnational care work and migration. Migrant nurses and caretakers of the elderly as entrepreneurs of the self 
are often highly indebted because they pay fees for nursing education in private institutions or to travel and placement agents. In skills, skill training, for example, in India and in the Philippines, nurses learn to treat diseases of wealthy Western countries and not the common diseases in their home country. This follows very much patterns of colonial education, for example, the construction of nursing as a gender profession in India by Anglo Saxon missionaries. Since the first time, the Bundesland in northern Germany has contracted agencies to recruit young Vietnamese to come to Germany and get a language and skill training as nurse for the elderly. So fees for agencies are banned, but women pay 10,000 children to agents for the trip and support. Indebtedness works as a facilitator for care extractivism, which nurtures the imperial mode of life. All these features signify that social reproduction is a mode of accumulation deeply embedded in the neoliberal capitalist regime. And if the state wants to further maintain the imperial mode of living, it tends to sustain the systemic structure by modernization and new technical and social fixes. We have to take into account the ongoing modernization strategies and understand their relevance for the imperial mode of living. Neva Dita Menon, an Indian feminist sociologist, calls digital surveillance, which is pushed forward during the pandemic, the top end of the corona capitalism, by the lower end is forced and precarious labor. They stand for a new mode of capitalist accumulation and the modernization of consumerism through Amazonization platforms and internet shopping. All this makes for a modernization of the imperial mode of living as well. The pandemic itself advances the digitalization of the health system, automatization and robotization in care and surgery, claiming to ease the labor of nursing sick and elderly people. Platformization, for example, the mushrooming, food delivery services and platforms where you can hire online care for the elderly or for children, or for cleaning and cooking for a few hours, claim to make care work redundant. They are based on dumping jobs and extreme precarious labor, mostly by migrants. At the same time, digitalization also results in more surveillance, for example, apps which measure and control behavior, mobility, and body, bodily function in everyday life. What is a very dangerous trend in the context of also authoritarianism um, and shrinking democracy. Additionally, it leads to intensification of care work due to so called documented. We have to further analyze this ambiguous development and the enshrined labor and power relation in a historical perspective in order to understand the resilience of the capitalist system and the consensual agency of the state, corporations, and middle classes to uphold the imperial mode of evil. And I doubt that this has been deeply delayed. So, however, I argue that at the peak of the pandemic in 2020, the neoliberal health system has been legitimized to some extent. Its failure to cope with the situation was stressed by protests and strikes for health care in many countries. They scandalized and politicized the neoliberal structures and the intensified care activity. So they are actors we should not lose sight. In the past 10 years, care work was taken up by a number of service oriented trade unions and integrated as a critical issue into feminism and other social movements in many countries. The precarious in Spain and the German network care revolution called for a local reorganizing and recognition of care work and care council on the community and municipality level, similar to climate. Food and 
how we will come. Solidarity cities offer caring and health facilities to all inhabitants, citizens, migrants, and non-documented people alike. Many link care issues with climate change, with a debate around commons, and caring for the rich. Following, following Gary Trumpel, politicizing care means to discuss it as an issue of democracy, justice, and privilege. This opens up pathways to shift the economy from the vintage concept of care as commons and the rational of caring, of use value, and public well being, as suggested by the Commission on Gender Equal Economy and the Care Manifesto in England. The imaginary is a caring economy, a caring state, I think Misha said it in the morning, and a caring enough. To wrap up, what do we find in the health sector tell us about further chances of the system change and the future dynamics of the implementment of living? The mechanisms of care activity create solutions to the crisis in terms of modernization of the nearly all structures and don't point in the direction of system change. I would agree that the corona crisis is not a minor crisis, but right now I won't say that it is a great crisis which cannot be overcome with the regime. Care for the elderly and nursing in hospitals are absolutely dependent from transnational care accessibility and not easily to convert, convert into solidarity mode of living. On the other hand, a growing number of community-based projects, such as housing cooperatives, urban agriculture, self-organized kindergartens, and solidarity clinics, explore the transformative potential of the care economy. And a large part of the young generation have already strategically chosen a road of emancipation of the, uh, of the convenient life at the expense of others and of the rich, constructing new identities and subjectivity and other models of that. It is not an either Naomi Klein's corona capitalism or Mike Davis' optimism for change. As in earlier post-crisis situations, we will face the two kinds of continuation of capitalist power regimes and stabilization through modernization, set, um, and explorations and practices of a solidarity care economy, meaning there are contradictory perspectives and directions in the mode of production, social reproduction, and the mode of living side by side in the society. And we have to settle once again in another version of the Gramscian narrative of the optimism of the heart and the pessimism of the intellect. My fear is, however, that based on the current polarization in societies, the tensions and even violence between those who want to preserve the imperial mode of living and those who want to dismantle this is growing, and I see this very much in the experience of a strong anti feminist Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Krista. We will certainly come back to many of the topics that you raised. Uh, Tokyo. Yes. Uh, yes, um, hello. Um, before I will comment on on Brandon Wilson's paper, I have to get uh, two things out of my chest. Uh, the one thing is that it was mentioned yesterday that the mode of living was kind of a, a black box. And I don't think it's uh, it's a black box. Uh, imperial mode of, of living is uh, a way of uh, it's a pattern of the consumption. It's a lifestyle 
it is a mode of uh, living and it can be described um, rather specific and concrete in in uh, the way we consume uh, all kinds of products, uh, fruits, uh, um, avocado and mangoes from Peru or from uh, uh, South Africa or from India and so on, and all the electronics uh, devices and iPhones we have to shift every second year and iPads and templates and other electronic uh, from, uh, from uh, Asia and um, uh, automobiles and holidays and, and leisure. It, it, it can be described uh, very uh, precise, I, I think. Uh, and I think that's also, for me, it's important to underline that the imperial mode of living is imperial, uh, meaning that it's based on um, the exploitation of uh, a periphery. And, and I think this is, again, this is no black box as, as Marcel's uh, presentation at the beginning of the conference was the uh, historical um, uh, development of the imperial uh, uh, mode uh, show. The other thing uh, I think is uh, I want to get out of my uh, chest is that it seems to me that the idea that a northern working class uh, is participating in the exploitation of the proletariat in the global south is such an appalling uh, position and statement and that it's often necessary in the next sentence to modify it and to differentiate it and to uh, blur it. And yes, I think it's correct that there is there is um, there is a, a precarious and there is uh, immigrants working on 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 very poor con condition, especially in in North America and, and, and in Southern Europe, but also in, in Denmark we had an incident on Filipino truck drivers uh, working for um, at five euros per day and living in a in a in a container on on, on very very bad uh, uh, con condition. So this uh, it exists in the in the global north. There is there is pocket of third world in the global north, but it's it, it, it's not half of the population. It's maybe ten or or uh, uh, 20 percent, the majority, the waste majority lives in a, in an imperial mode of living. And on the other side, yes, in the global south, there is, uh, have developed a substantial uh, middle class, which live in an imperial mode of, of living in China and India and in other places. But again, this is uh, uh, 10 or maybe 20 percent. So I, I think it's important to underline that the waste majority of the population in, in the global north, I'm talking about maybe 80% is living on an imperial mode of living, and it's less than 20% which do it in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, global south. Um, this said, I will turn to Marcus and Edison, and, and I agree with them very much that we are in, in a deep uh, crisis. Um, the late uh, Wallerstein was also of, of this uh, opinion, and he did not believe that capitalism would survive this, uh, this uh, century. So I think that the system is in a, a, a deep uh, a, a crisis, both economically and ecologically, and a political a deep uh, a crisis. Um, so we are entering a very dramatic uh, uh, period in uh, in uh, history, and uh, the question is: uh, Will will this uh, go down to some kind of system which is worse than the current system, or uh, are we capable of of uh, creating a solidarity mode of uh, uh, living? Um, here, I think I will concentrate on 
on what we have discussed earlier about uh, China. Uh, China, I think, is a very important uh, discussion point in this kind of connection because it's uh, obvious because it's 1.4 billion uh, uh, people and, and, and this is 20% of the world's uh, population and it's the second largest uh, economy and maybe it's firing to, to be the biggest uh, economy in uh, a few years. So what happens in China in terms of, of production and consumption patterns are of the also most uh, uh, importance. In the last uh, decades, uh, China has developed this middle class I, I talked about uh, later, which have in many ways copied imperial mode of, uh, of uh, living. But what about uh, the the rest, the one billion workers on and uh, peasants, what what uh, will happen in uh, China with them? I think that China also have realized that neoliberalism has lost its power and its uh, its esteem, and they are changing their e e economy at the moment and. Contrary to uh, yesterday, I don't think that they are going to be a new uh, big imperialist power. I think that China has been sliding to the left in the, in the last uh, years, both in terms of economy and, uh, and uh, politics. Uh, the new buzzword in, in China is common prosperity. And uh, this means that they want to raise the uh, standard of living uh, for, for the peasantry and, and, and for the workers in the, in the commons uh, area. There have been in the recent months a crackdown on uh, corruption in the party. Around 25,000 members of the party are under investigation, including top members close to Xi. Uh, so I think that there's a, that's, that's a change going on in China. They have also changed that tax system or going to change the uh, tax system and last week there the, the courts said that the 996 uh, working system working from nine to nine six days uh, a week is going to be illegal uh, so will china develop a new kind of of mode of uh, living this is uh, i think it's an uh, important uh, question um, Brandon Bisson defined this uh, severity mode of living as not to live at the cost of others and at the cost of nature. That means to overcome a mode of production that essentially rests on exploitation of human labor power and the destruction of new physical foundation of life on Earth. Just as globalized capitalism uh, with its imperialist transfer of value is the basis of the imperial mode of living, then I think solidarity mode of living also must have a corresponding mode of production and distribution of, of uh, waste, both on the national and uh, global level. I think in the short run, that, and that I mean from the next five to ten years, the majority of the population in the global north has an interest in defending the imperial mode of living while the population in the South have two options, I hear again, think maybe, uh, mainly in, uh, in uh, uh, China. Will they try to copy paste the imperial mode of uh, living, or will they try to uh, develop another kind of sustainable and, and solidarity alternative? If they are going to try to copy paste the imperial mode of, of living, then there will be a fierce competition with states in the global north about resources and, and so on. If they choose the second opinion, they will generate a life and death struggle of global uh, capitalism. There are, of course, also contradiction and traps in the imperial mode of living in the, in the global north. We should not sit and wait uh, for what they do in the, the global south. We should have act also to uh, weaken the imperial mode of living. It's important to keep in mind that the imperial mode of living 
is a manifestation of a temporary solution of the contradiction within capitalism between expanding production and stagnating consumption, uh, which solved by externalization, mainly imperialism. This is the old, uh, actually the old uh, concept of uh, Luxembourg. And consequently, I think the main opposition is to be found in the surrounding external areas where exploitation of humans are and nature are most uh, severe. The development of class struggle in, in China, India, South Africa, Egypt, and Brazil and Mexico, I think, will be very perceived. However, as this struggle moves forward, I think it will deepen the crisis in the imperial mode of, of living in the global north because it's, it takes some of the, uh, the cheap uh, labor uh, out, out, out away and and this would harm the imperial mode of the, of the uh, living. So our struggle within the belly of the beast, I think, can play an important role. There are and has always there are and have always been countless streams also in the global north act of solidarity. Uh, there has been resistance against imperialist war, support to movements in the global south, uh, south. And I think it's very important that we try to create links uh, between uh, labors in the global production chains. One of the most encouraging examples have, have been um, um, among stewards uh, working in, in the uh, harbors, in the global harbors. There, there is a history, history of, uh, of global cooperation between uh, workers in, uh, in the harbors, and I think we should start in the, uh, that. Uh, but solidarity is also changing our way of living. So we so we do not participate in the exploitation of others or harm our common environment. Yes. Thank you, Tokyo. Uh, then we can move on with our discussion. Who would like to say something? Gailing. Gailing, please. Feel free to speak. Unmute. Unmuted. Is that is that okay now? Come here, Bob. Yes, we we can listen to Gailing. We can listen. I've I've done Is that can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, okay. You, you can hear me. Okay, good. <laughs> um, Lancaster, yeah. are you hearing me? Yes, we yes, are. Yes, we are now. Yeah. So, can I speak now? Is that it? No. Maybe we first uh, ask Stefan Schmalz to speak and then Michael Brie, and then we come back to uh, Ngaili. Okay. Stefan? Start the video. You are muted. Hi. Can you hear me? Um, just, um, well, maybe just to link back a little bit uh, to some uh, stuff Torkel has said and to the presentation from Uli and uh, Markus. Um, the question, and also to Neiling, so she will speak uh, later. Um, I thought it quite inspiring, uh, the discussion of, well, transformation or crisis of the imperial mode of living. Uh, in particular, if we take some of the ca uh, cases discussed, like China, this was exactly yesterday when Nai Ling was presenting on the involutionary mode um, of living. Same thought as I had, like what, what was talk, uh, Tokel now saying, uh, that there are some signs of, of transformation and crisis, definitely, of the imperial mode of living. And exactly what Tokel has said about the Tio uh, Tio Liu um, culture, the 996 culture, about the crackdown of the digital economy, there are some signs that the one could say the pendular, the Polanian pendular, is somehow swinging back. And it has also certain implications for, for yeah, what Uli uh, 
um, and Marcus have written on the pure mode of living and what Nyling has said that there that that's some sort of crisis um, that um, this idea of 8% GDP growth and uh, consumption, which is spreading to far uh, larger parts of the population, um, that there are certainly some contradictions. And I think that's it's quite striking. And also, if we look to other world regions, Latin America, the highly contested new new extractivism, uh, I think, unfortunately, our uh, Brazilian uh, speaker is isn't uh, she isn't here anymore, but. Um, the question, what will happen next year in case of there will be like a center-left government in Brazil? So what will they do? Will they simply revive the old growth-driven uh, strategy with a um, growth acceleration program? Um, so I think this question of crisis, which is actually transforming or which is actually um, or maybe it's even a crisis. So, but that, that that would be something very interesting to do research on, not just uh, in the U.S. and Germany and the conflicts about um, uh, one could say like the new right emerging um, on the one hand. Um, well, it's not that new anymore. Um, and uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> the attempts like these three different um, ways you you mapped. Um, the three scenarios, uh, the huge uh, interventions now on, on the European scale for a European Green Deal. So that's really, really interesting. I think it might be very interesting also to look at other world regions, how, what is happening. And China is, is particular, really interesting. And I'm very interested what Nai Ling will be saying now on this topic. But uh, so that's at least my thought that in China, some far-reaching changes are happening right now. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Let's continue with uh, Michael, and then uh, we ask Ndaimi. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you also for the presentation and then the comments. I want to concentrate on some points. The first is, uh, Uli, you, you used um, on the one hand, and Markus also, the scenario approach, and then you said, in fact, what you are presenting are projections. I think it would be useful for the coming time to make a clear distinction between projections. Uh, that means projects, yeah, organized. That means some understanding, basic understanding how uh, economy, poli politics, uh, the consumption patterns, uh, mode of life uh, um, could work. That means the, the patterns, the, the uh, actors have in mind um, how to deal with the problems and scenarios, and that means um, how what what is the what we assume what will happen in the future. Yeah, because I think it's uh, it's quite important, and we should we should uh, uh, and I would also propose maybe to to work on both projects on both these things um, separately and maybe also to organize a um, project on real on real scenarios because one thing also hearing you uh, you uh, is clear that um, um, uh, we, we are we could be quite aware that uh, sudden events are eigenes in German or states of emergencies or so-called black swans will come. That will happen. Uh, we have seen it now with the pandemic, but I think other events may totally uh, shatter the, the confidence much more than already now. And this can change in one moment, um, uh, um, in a short uh, time, totally the situation. So I think uh, also the theory must bring these possibilities of such sudden changes. Yeah? The interregnum means that there can be totally totally unnormal situations and, um, um, and of course it can be used by barbarian right-wing forces but also by other forces and one should prepare what how to how to act in such a, in such a very open situation. 
uh, or in today we spoke about Lenin. Lenin was uh, able to to use such as it in what to the better or to the worse. I won't discuss, but this is important as we have seen it with with others uh, uh, figures in the history also. So this is one one problem I want to mention. The second is. Um, um, uh, Marcus, you were referring to the, uh, and I totally uh, support this um, this uh, program, a public provision of social and, of course, of other uh, forms of uh, infrastructure, uh, physical infrastructure, the whole platform infrastructure, and so on. I just want to mention um, we should be aware these are these are somehow common foundations, communist foundations. So we, we, we see that in, in the current situation, the, the uh, communism gets a new new meaning yeah? in the real sense that um, there are much important, much important services and so on, which should be under common control in the regional, local, national, or even global level. And uh, this is challenging the whole liberal democracy. And if this is the case, we should also discuss how to break this consensus of liberal democracy. What is important about China, again, this was already mentioned several times now, um, China is challenging the supremacy of liberal democracy and the liberal market understanding. I think that we, we should ask ourselves how, what does means, what it means for actors here in the in uh, in the north. Um, yeah, this were my um, main points. Just one remark to to the uh, position of Lawson. You said that the the liberal classes in the north have an interest to keep the imperial mode of life. I think this is too deterministic. I, I, it depends if there are other possibilities. If the problem is, from my experiences, from Soviet experiences and GDR experiences, is things are going on as long as there are no alternatives. Yeah, and we should not blame uh, people who are just um, adapting to the circumstances if um, there are no alternatives. It means open up, opening up may also change the perception of interest. Ah, yeah, okay. And the last remark, um, I think uh, Uli, you spoke about the discussion in Germany. I totally right. I totally agree with this with Clara Wagenknecht, Oskar Lafontaine in the left and so on. The problem is also that uh, and you are, of course, aware about this. We should speak. Uh, we should speak about the uh, contradictions we all are in. We all are in. Uh, often, um, uh, I think there is a tendency. <laughs> of course, not with you. I know. I, I know. Of course not. But I see it in the in the left in Germany to 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 look for some phrases which are totally ex excluding the contradictions. The workers are in, the left is in, all of us are in, and then uh, this, this is not, this is not, uh, with such an attitude, you are not trustworthy. You are not trustworthy. And I think this is very important. We should, we should also work on, on models and also uh, projections and so on, which are, help us which are helping us to deal with these contradictions in a more uh, confident way thank you thank you michael uh, now let's see again if we can reach uh, ngaili hello Yes. yes ah, there you are. Okay. Yeah, I am. Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, I'm in. Oh, ooh, too much to say <laughs> and uh, too little time. Uh, if I got the time, I've got three things to say, but I think I would. I should try just to prioritize. First of all, is reacting to some theoretical issue first. Theoretically, when I mention one has to open the black box, 
when I say the black box, the black box was the hegemonization and subjectivization processes black box. I'm not saying the imperial mode of production black box. It's analyzing using a serious Gramscian approach to open the black box, the black box of what? The black box of hegemonization and subjectivization processes in understanding any kind of hegemony. Of course, okay, you're talking about hegemonic imperial mode of production, then the same apply. It applies to other kinds of hegemony, okay? So that was my black box issue. Secondly, about China. Oh, yes, I've got a lot to say on that, okay? If, uh, if I may just have a little bit of time, but I, I'll try my best. I think theoretically, I'm interested in dialectics, okay? I'm not interested in just simply seeing them as model of capitalism or model of or ideal model of this and that. I'm interested, okay, in dialectics. If I'm interested in dialectics, of course, then I have to talk about the tendency and counter tendency. And in my presentation, I have tried to bring up, I'm not saying that there's no tendency. All I'm trying to say is given I've only given 20 minutes or under pressure, even within with that 20 minutes, okay? I have to, okay, sums it up by three dialectics. It could be more, of course. And of course, currently the dialectics is moving a bit in the tendency direction. The tendency direction, some people only read the official rhetoric, okay? Only listen to the official rhetoric, such as, of course, the current buzzword is, okay, common prosperity. But I see, okay, one put it back into the, into the bigger schema of analysis of dialectics, then there is just a swing back of a tendency. The tendency this time is how the party elite, and even not only the party elite, let me put it in the other way, is the princelings, okay? The princelings within the party elite trying to survive another round of, another round of what? Another round of crisis. Now, COVID is coming, export is difficult, okay? You know, the big, the big, Capital in China now, the Alibaba, et cetera, et cetera, are there, okay, like it or not, all right? And the question is some even challenging, okay, in the, the princeling, the, the advantages of the princelings. So what happened is, of course, the princeling, okay, is bringing out another round of rhetoric. The other round of rhetoric at the moment is common prosperity, okay? in order to bring about an other fix, okay? An other, if you like, political fix, all right? You know, of course, it's through rhetoric, okay? And the rhetoric of that. And of course, okay, you know, bring it about realizing, as I said in my talk, okay, you know, they take every opportunity now, okay, to discredit or try to clamp down this involutionary lay flatism, okay? Lay flatism may, 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 may turn into a movement. It's not just simply how people feel about it, okay? They even talk about lay flatism, okay, which is not the same as burnout, okay? And the question is, as I've said here, okay, you know, the other side, okay, you know, if you like the subaltern, the working class, even the middle class are feeling those pinches, if you like. So what happened here would be, okay, you know, they have to find ways. They have to find ways, another way of, if you like, okay, bringing about performance legitimacy because China is not election, okay, no election, nothing, okay, you know, in a sense, okay, well, this sort of, you know, facade type election, but it's really performance legitimacy. So they're trying to bring about a new rhetoric, okay, that will make another round of, okay, judge me in three years time, not now, okay, we're trying very hard. We're trying very hard, okay, to do something about 996, like any, any system, okay, you know, you hop from, it's the displacement strategy. Okay, so you hop on one to the next. You hop, now China is not, no, no. Well, anyway, I'll stop talking about whether it is a transformation model or not. Okay, but anyway, I think that's going too far. But 
the issue is, okay, it's very difficult for me, okay, quickly, okay, in within a, a conference like this, okay, to say, all right, you know, how to analyze China. But I have written a lot on China. And uh, I'm not trying to promote my work, but the question is if you're indeed even really interested in China, both from an academic angle, and obviously maybe from a policy angle, but I work more on the academic angle. The academic angle is, okay, I've written things, okay, which if you're interested, I can send it through email, okay, to people who might be interested. But let me just quickly say one or two major pieces that might have implication for this conference. And that is, okay, a while ago, okay, or there was a debate between David Harvey, okay, David Harvey, the well-known Marxist geographer, okay, and I was on from Berkeley, okay, about the nature of neoliberalism in China. Okay, David Harvey has his version. Iwa Ong has his her, has her version. Now the question is, then Jamie Peck. Okay, some of you might know Jamie Peck's work. Okay, a radical geographer came in. Okay, and said that. Okay, well, and he actually wrote to me and said, Eileen, okay, I would like to invite you to write a piece. Okay, and try to intervene into the Harvey Iwa Ong debate. I try my best, okay, think about it, okay, from, 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 from a lot of basic thing up, and I came up with, okay, you know, the idea of the nature of new liberalism in China, which I argue as being all the liberal authoritarian capitalism that is not a variety of capitalism, but it is a very gated kind of capitalism. Okay, I don't want to go into this variegation. If you're interested, okay, some geographers are already talking about variegated capitalism instead of models or comparative models of capitalism. Because capitalism now in a global era are integrated. They are variegated. Once one side changed, the other side changed as well. Okay, so it's not a fixed model of capitalism, okay, where you just identify some characteristic. It is a lot more complicated than that. But anyway. So I, 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 I reacted to the invitation and wrote a piece, and that piece is now in ooh, a South Atlantic Quarterly, okay? If you're interested, I can send it through, okay? Which I argue the nature of, of, of new liberalism in China is the liberal. And another one that you might be interested, okay, which I argue, okay, China is possibly going in the direction of new colonialism, especially looking at the one belt, one road, and how the receiving country is seeing the okay, project, right? The receiving country, such as the Pakistan, okay? Such as if you like the Sri Lanka, et cetera, et cetera. So, okay, not just simply, okay, Chinese rhetoric, okay? Of course, Rhetoric are beautiful. They are meant to be beautiful. Okay, peaceful rise of China. Okay, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, so of course, okay, as academic, you know, sort of, uh, we need to, okay, or critical academic, we need to open up, okay, you know, the black box, the black box of China, if you like, another you know, black box. But the black box is always, okay, academically related, from my point of view, always dialectics. Now, that's my second point. May Do I have time for a third point, Chair? Uh, yes, you have, if you oh, keep okay. it short. I Yesterday I gave you one I minute will, and you I took three. Said, so. I will cut it short and I, will, I promise I'll shut up afterwards. Okay. Okay, so the third point is actually related to uh, Marcus' presentation, okay, which I think we need to address the speaker. The third point is Marcus, uh, and that is especially in his scenario, future scenario. And one of the scenario is solitary mode of living. Yes, okay, of course it's motherhood and apple pie. Nobody would say no to solitary, okay, mode of living. But the question is, given me, I'm interested in dialectics. So the dialectics for me is, do we need to consider the current development in capitalism now in relation, not just simply proposing a further scenario, but do we need to, okay, you know, in relation to, okay, that scenario, okay, we would love to see, of course, we all love to see, okay, but with realistically, do we need to address the current stage of the development of capitalism? The current stage of development of capitalism, from my point of view, is, if you like, okay, the fourth industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution of AI, 
okay? Artificial, artificial intelligence, algorithm, et cetera, et cetera. Do we need to see solidarity mode of living or solitary mode of living in the midst of, okay, the onslaught of, okay, well, dare I use the word, the word is around anyway, okay, and that is algorithmic and data capitalism. In other words, capitalism has gone on to, okay, algorithm, algorithmic and data capitalism, and this algorithmic and data capitalism, okay, in terms of the everyday life, we are emerging. What is emerging is a, if you like, it's a, it's a cyber, it's a cyberization of life. It's a cyberization of everyday life. When I say cyberization of everyday life, it's the intimate cyber, okay? You know, sociologists work a lot on it, okay? And that this is cyber way of life is a mix of, if you like, okay, you know, human and machine. Human and machine interact, cyber, cyber, cyberization of life. Where can we see the cyberization of life now? We can see the cyberization of life in things such as TikTok. Okay, we can see cyberization of life such as okay, Big Brother. Okay, all these, if you like, the commodification of the self, not just simply the commodification of out there. Okay, from land to resources, okay, et cetera, et cetera. We see with AI the commodification of self, the self as data. Okay, hospital. Hospital are interested in our data. Okay, you no know, medical insurance are interested in our data and of course sell on our data. That is part of algorithmic, okay, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, capitalism. So my question, okay, I finally come to my question. <sighs> Okay, so my question is, what's the implication for this solitary mode of living or solitary way of life, okay, vis-a-vis -vis the very current development of the cyberization of life, the commodification. It's really very deep now. It's only when you use Foucault and use Foucault's work to look at the commodification of the self those Foucault do not use those terms, but the self, okay, what one has to, you know, think about, okay, do we need not to address in future scenario, okay, the scenario of the fourth industrial revolution and its impact on capitalism and the impact on self and the implication for solidary, okay, way of life. I promise I will shut up from now on. <laughs> Thank you, Ngailing. Uh, Uli wants to say something. Yes, this is really fascinating. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry that I um, put um, a message in the chat that was supposed to be for only for one participant, but obviously it went to all the discussion participants. Um, Ngailing, I find this very interesting, the cyborgization of life. When I um, travel with the subway, and 80% um, of the people is looking uh, at the um, screen of the cell phone. This is also, in a sense, a cyborgization of life. Yes. And um, yeah, and um, a weakness of our approach is still that we don't delve so much into technological issues, but this is a major challenge, and you put your finger on it. A second re remark, and then I uh, come uh, to a thought is, um, Nailing, I now I think I got your criticism on our book when it comes to China. We refer to China not to understand the system, the dynamics, but only as an illustration. But I, I, I take your point, and I already said it also yesterday, we are not specialists on China, and but we should be more careful and engage more with your literature and others and to update it with our thinking. And this is a very, very good. So one thought, and maybe it's also already a bridge for the final, uh, for the final discussion. Um, Christa, you said that we are probably over-optimistic. And I... Um, um, insisted, no, it's potential learning processes. It's not that we say it is, but it, um, it, when you said this, it came to my mind what Bob said yesterday, Bob said, and uh, I'm sorry, this morning, the struggles over the interpretation of the crisis or the crises is key. And there's a role of intellectuals. And when we were writing it in summer 2020, and when we write about green capitalism since uh, 10 years, yeah, and trying to understand the dynamics which now come become visible, but we published uh, already what are the features, the forms of the green capitalism uh, many years ago. But the point, the question for Krista, for Bob, and for us is, 
what is then our role not to be naive and not to be over optimistic but to 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 be part of this interpretation what what um, bob was pointing uh, at this morning and what is our role beside the the harsh the realistic analysis when it comes for example to scenarios knowing that among the three scenarios the third of course is the weakest but if we have an interest a political interest and the desire in transforming society, we should outline the certain scenario without being naive, but um, but um, let's say making it visible. Because if not, as I said at the end of my intervention, the the whole debate on alternatives remain within the greening of capitalism, and then and 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 the rest stays um, stays uh, uh, remains outside. That, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Uli, then Markus. Yeah, many thanks also from my side for your excellent comments. And yeah, um, one thing that I learned from Krista's comment is that the care perspective helps us to even better understand the resilience and at the same time, the fragility of the imperial mode of living. I think this was quite impressive in what you have presented. The fragility maybe in, in, in two ways. The first, on, on one hand, the vulnerability that has been shown by the interruption of care chains in the corona crisis. And on the other hand, on protest. Yeah. We have seen protests, particularly in the care sector in recent times in countries of the global north. Yeah. I had to think of a paper by Ingrid Artus a sociologist working on labor relations who talked about the feminization of protest and the tertiarization of protest, so that the protest increasingly takes pl take place in the care sector. So labor struggles um, as um, something that takes place in the care sector and that also show the fragility of a neoliberal organization of the care sector of the foundational economy on which we all depend. This would be a first point. The second point is Nailin Ni has um, um, comment that the solidarity mode of living has always been seen in the context and in relation to the current stage of capitalism, which is the fourth industrial revolution, cyberization of everyday life, commodification of self. I think it's very important. So we, we don't want to, to create a... Um, something that is um, completely decoupled or that is even um, slightly decoupled from what is really happening in capitalism. So our claim would be to really ground the alternatives in the tendencies that we can observe. I see that, of course, um, this, um, this force, this enormous power of the digitalization of everyday life, but I also see that it is contested. Yeah? It is contested and it's not clear to which extent it will shape, for example, labor relations, to which extent it will shape, for example, industry. There are still contests. Of course, there are very strong forces in the direction you have mentioned, but it's still contested. And, and this might be even more important, it is vulnerable. It is very vulnerable to disruptions. Disruptions in a material sense, for example, disruptions regarding the resource provision, we see that um, in current times that, for example, the many parts of the industries in Germany and I think in other countries too struggle because there is a lack of access, a lack of provision with semiconductors. So the digitalization, the fourth industrial revolution is highly dependent on resources, on value chains, on conditions that itself cannot secure. And we have to take this into account when we talk about the viability of a solidarity mode of living then because in case of disruptions and the pandemic is a very important disruption we are always thrown back to that what really matters to the foundational economy to the provision of the life supporting services that is what i think is the real life background that is what is the social condition against which we can talk about the, uh, um, against the background of which we can talk about the possibilities of a solidarity mode of living. So it is not something that is just 
hanging in the air. I think it's very, it's something that is really grounded in current experience, in the contradictions of the fourth industrial revolution and other um, development tendencies of capitalism. To um, come just shortly to what Micha has said, I think I've already taken up one of your arguments. We have to think about disruptions, disruptive events. I think this is very important. And I think the summer, the summer of disasters, even in the global north, has emphasized this necessity. I think we as a left would have to think about what could be a left politics and the left concept of resilience. Yeah. Resilience is something that has been pushed forward very strongly by, yeah, let's say, mainstream environmental science and environmental sciences, more or less decoupled from critical social science debate. And I think this is a very important thing that we have to do as social scientists from the left. What I also would like to stress is that we have to talk about liberal democracies, the liberal democracy and its crisis. I think liberal democracy will not be able to cope with the contradictions of capitalism anymore. Liberal democracy is a form of democracy that has proved to be highly compatible with capitalism up to this point in time, but it is not, it is not any, it isn't compatible anymore. I think we are in a situation where the contradictions of capitalism have aggravated in a way that they cannot be processed within the institutions of liberal democracy anymore. And this um, is politicized by the right, yeah, because they struggle for authoritarian, even fascist forms of the organization of the state. But it can also politicized by the left in the direction of radical democracy. I think we have to talk about this. We have to talk about radical democracy as a requirement of a process of social ecological transformation. When we talk about social ecological transformation in a strong sense, we have to foster sufficiency. That means we have to think about how to organize the economy in a way that it serves a good life, that it serves what we need that serves the foundational aspects of social life, that it really is use value oriented. And these are questions that simply cannot be answered by the market anymore. We need to do this within democratic uh, a framework of, of radical democracy. I think this is very important. Economic democracy is a form of radical democracy. It is a form of extending democracy to those spheres of life that have been systematically excluded from the democratic decision-making processes under the condition of liberal, liberal democracy. That is how the left can politicize the crisis of liberal democracy. And I think we should go on discussing and thinking in this direction. Thank you, uh, Markus. Uh, Krista, the floor is yours, but can you please keep it brief? Yeah. We have only four minutes left. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to... Uh, to react to Marcus' uh, remark on uh, protests and struggles by care workers in Europe. No, that's not true. It's an absolutely international phenomenon, the struggle of uh, healthcare workers. And it has been during the pandemic, it has been, I would say, everywhere because. Um, Healthcare workers felt very much hurt that on top of being underpaid and undervalued, the state and the society and corporations didn't care to protect them in the pandemic situation. So they got infected, they went home and infected their family members and so on. And this was an entry point. Uh, it's, it's almost an, an international uh, new movement of um, uh, healthcare workers. And I just got uh, from Walden Bello an invitation for um, uh, on announcement of a global event to support essential workers in all countries uh, next week. So this is really an entry point for an international, international uh, internationalization of the labor struggle 
struggle in the healthcare sector. Thank you. And then the final word is for Torquil. No. no? Okay. Then uh, we are done for this moment. Uh, Uli has proposed that we shorten the break to 15 minutes. And so that we continue the discussion, the final discussion at uh, half past three. And uh, I hope that you will all be there as well and that you can relax in 15 minutes and that's enough. Thank you. <laughs>